Morning Journey Church, welcome to another daily devotional. Thank you for joining with me today. First thing you're going to notice here today, if you are an astute, astute viewer of these devotionals, and if you know uh, anything about me, if you've got um, uh, you've gotten to know me a little bit through uh, through sermons or being a part of the church, you'll know that I am an avid <clears throat> Denver Broncos fan. Yet today I'm wearing a Kansas City uh, T-shirt. Um, this uh, T-shirt was was made by my uh, sister's school. Uh, she is a, a principal of a deaf education school in Kansas City, and they're big Kansas City Chiefs fans. So today I'm wearing this shirt in honor of her. No, I am not betraying my loyalty to the Broncos. I still will root for the Broncos, but just in honor of my sister uh, wearing this shirt, which the K and the C is, is sign language on the shirt, if you can see that. Well, <clears throat> enough said about that. Uh, hopefully I won't get any hate mail uh, from my fellow Denver Broncos fans for wearing a Kansas City shirt. Let's jump into the devotional, however, today, and let's look at what Jesus has to say to us uh, in Matthew chapter 11. We're going to look today at verses 11 through, th or, I'm sorry, chapter 11, verses 20 through 30. Uh, again, as we go through the gospel of Matthew. Now, there's two things that we're going to look at today. We are going to look at, in these verses, uh, we're going to look at a condemnation, and we're going to look at an invitation. So two different two different things uh, that Jesus is going to wrap up chapter 12, uh, chapter 11 with before we get into chapter 12. Uh, we'll look at the condemnation and the invitation uh, here this morning. So let's start with a condemnation. The condemnation is what Jesus starts this with, and I'm just going to teach through this and give you something to think about and uh, look at and meditate on here uh, on, this, uh, on this morning. So let's look at a condemnation that Jesus is going to give. And here's the words that Jesus said. Then he began to rebuke the cities in which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. And here are the words that Jesus said, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And so what Jesus is referring to, uh, he is referring to, he's starting to rebuke these cities because they he did incredibly mighty works. And in the mighty works that Jesus had done, uh, they refused to repent. Their hearts were not repentant. Their hearts weren't turned at all. And it says because most of his mighty works were done in these cities. They experienced a greater light than the other regions did they experienced more of Jesus's works. They experienced the mighty works. They have seen the evidence of Jesus. They had more light given to them, and yet they still did not repent. Greater light requires greater accountability. The principle here is that the greater the light given, the greater the responsibility to respond to that light. Now, what that means is for the Western world today, which we are a part of, the Western world who is founded in Christian principles and a Christian belief system, we will have more accountability than those who did not have the light of, of Christ. We will have a greater level of accountability. We have had access to the gospel that no other society has ever had uh, access to. If you compare our freedoms today, we uh, every home pretty much has a Bible. Most homes have multiple Bibles. Everyone has access to going and being a part of a church. You have access to being a part of a Bible study. You have access to being able to pray. You have access to being a part of a small group. Um, you have on the internet multitudes of podcasts and sermons and and television sermons. You have multiple things that you can listen to. We have more access to the gospel than anywhere else in the world. Compare us to North Korea or India or China, um, Iraq, Iran, Somalia. You look at some of those places, they have no access to the gospel. In fact, owning a Bible could be a uh, reason for you to be uh, killed or at least thrown into jail. They have to meet in secret. They have to meet in home uh, studies. They don't have the same freedoms that we have. We have, as a society, access to the gospel and the mighty works of God uh, the way that, that Chorazin, the way that Bethsaida had. We have a greater light 
because of what we have been given, therefore we have a greater responsibility. Our society, even though we have been given a greater light in the same way as these communities, we are in desperate need of repentance. Richard France, the Bible commentator, said these words. Uh, he said, unresponsiveness to the voice of God is the characteristic of this generation and will be its downfall. Did you hear that? Unresponsiveness to the voice of God is the characteristic of this generation and will be its downfall. We have been given every gift, every ability, and every opportunity, and yet we have refused to receive it. We have refused in the same way they did. We have refused to repent, and our judgment will be that much greater. It also somewhat implies here that there's going to be different degrees of judgment. I, I don't exactly know what those are. There are some verses in the Bible that refer to or allude to a difference in degrees of judgment. All I could say is that because of what we have been given, we are going to receive the harshest of judgment like these communities, Chorazin, Bethsaida, uh, these who have been given so much and seen such mighty works of God, yet still refuse to repent. And if it had been done in the other areas of Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago uh, in sackcloth and ashes. Um, then he goes on to say this, but I say to you, uh, again, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you and you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works were done in you, uh, which were done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. And we know the story of Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed by God because of the wickedness that was there. But if they had had the revelations that we have had, or the revelations that Capernaum had had, they would have repented. Capernaum, was really the, the headquarters of the ministry of Jesus. It was the headquarters of all that he was going to do. They had seen and they had heard the Son of God, and yet even though they had seen it and heard it, they remained as hardened as ever. William Barclay said, uh, William Barclay is another Bible com commentator, he said, these cities did not attack Jesus Christ. They did not drive him from their gates. They did not seek to crucify him. They simply re disregarded him. Neglect can kill as much as persecution can. Did, did you hear that? These cities did not attack Jesus. They didn't crucify Jesus. They didn't drive Jesus away. They just disregarded him. Neglect, William Barclay says, can kill as much as persecution can. Well, let's keep going on with this picture of, of what Jesus is doing, this condemnation that he gives, uh, and he's saying to them, you have a, a, a response, you are called to repent, but they stayed with hardened hearts. That's really a picture of what our society is today. We've give, been given every opportunity. Everything has been handed to us. Every freedom has been handed to us. We have seen the evidence of what God has done, and yet we still remain hard-hearted and don't, uh, don't seek after him and don't repent. Jesus then says, But I say to you that it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. In other words, again, he is kind of giving this indication of different degrees of judgment. Sodom, when they are judged, won't be judged as harshly as these other places will be judged because they have seen the full revelation. So there is somewhat of a degree of judgment that is being referred to by Jesus. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent, and you have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father, no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. And so Jesus says this, he says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. It's it's Jesus referring to, again, um, 
the picture of the Trinity and the picture of the communion of the Trinity and the communion of joy that they that they are able to uh, experience. Um, they these things have all been hidden from the wise and the prudent, but God has revealed them to what what He uses the words that He uses is to babes, people who don't know as much, people who don't have. Um, have all of the de the degrees and the abilities. He's revealed them to babes like us, people who didn't grow up in that culture, who didn't experience the culture, who didn't go through the religious systems of the day. The people that would reject Jesus, um, those are the ones that missed what he was doing. The ones that would accept him were the wise, the prudent, who have been revealed, the, the babes that have been revealed too. And then Jesus relates the picture of the relationship that he has with the Father. Um, Matthew eleven twenty seven reveals just so much about the relationship that Jesus has with the Father, the Father and the Son, the kind of relationship they have. And so... Everything that it says here, that the uh, uh, that he has hidden the things from the prudent, revealed them to the babes, even so the Father, it seemed good in your sight. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. No one knows the Father except uh, Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him. So what it's relating to is that, that there are no secrets between the Father and the Son. There's no one who knows the Son as well as the Father does. There's no one who knows the Father as well as the Son does. And the Son chooses to reveal the Father to the ones that will really seek after him. Not everybody, but the ones that will actually seek after him. That's the, the picture of what happens. And now Jesus moves from the condemnation onto the invitation. And so let's look today uh, at the invitation. The invitation, the invitation that Jesus gives, he summarizes it in, uh, in three verses. Here's what he says. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. And I, I want to point out the first, uh, the uh, almost um, one of the last words that is said, uh, this little phrase he uses, he says, you will find rest for your souls. That is what the that's what the soul of people is craving. People want to find rest. People are striving, striving in life in a variety of ways. They're striving to earn God's favor. They're striving to earn God's forgiveness. They're striving to try to reach God. They're striving to figure out God. They're striving to make money, to provide for a family. They're striving to uh, have relationships and build relationships. They're striving at work every day. And what we crave the most in our hearts and in our souls is just coming to the point of rest, where you can just kind of let yourself down, just, just kind of the ah moment, where you can just sit and rest. That is one of the things that we have the privilege of when we have a relationship with Jesus is that we can come to him and we could finally rest. No more striving, no more putting out labor, no more trying to perform to get God to like me, uh, no more trying to figure out things, no more trying to... Um, no more trying to 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 strive uh, to accomplish or perform. I just finally find that awe moment where I can just rest in him. Jesus is saying this to the people who are laboring and heavy laden. Those are the ones that Jesus says to them, you come to me. Come to me, the ones that are heavy laden, the ones that are labored. And you can kind of picture that. You can picture if you've seen, um, you know, pictures in Africa of a person carrying a, a large bundle of stuff on their, on their head or on their shoulders. To me, that's the picture of being heavy laden, the ones that are really uh, under a tremendous amount of weight, the ones that are, that are self-reliant and self-striving and trying to accomplish life on their own, uh, the ones that are working hard and instead of, uh, instead of coming to Jesus, they're just trying to be self-sufficient and self-reliant. And Jesus says, the ones that are worn out, tired, heavy laden, under a big burden, the ones that are just trying to be self-sufficient, do it all themselves, you come to me, and if you will come to me, I will give you rest. 
what a cool concept this is to be able to come to Jesus and finally be able to just sit in his presence and just rest and know that I don't have to strive anymore. I have been fully forgiven. I have been completely redeemed, not by my own efforts, but by the work that Jesus does. And I can come to him and I can find rest in him for my worn out and tired and laboring soul. And then he says, you, you, my yoke, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Now, the yoke in those days did not did not refer to um, the contraption that a pair of, of cattle or oxen would use. That's not what the what a yoke was. That may be what we think of as a yoke today, but that's not what it was referring to in the day of Jesus. A yoke was a rabbi's way of teaching, a rabbi's way of instruction. It was called their yoke. Another word for it is the mantle. Take my mantle. Take my yoke. Take my interpretations upon you take my yoke upon you take my system upon you because my system is not one of striving and one of performing and one of trying to earn your way to god my yoke is easy my yoke is light the burden that i am going to put on your shoulders is a light burden it's not much of a burden at all and so he's saying and inviting people to take his way of instruction and teaching upon ourselves and when you are willing to do that life just becomes rest how great would it be to live out the remaining years of life whether it is five years 20 years, 50 years, however many years of life we have before us, how many years you have before, and just finally be able to say, I can, I can finally rest. To have the assurance to know that Jesus has forgiven me. To have the assurance to know by walking with him, I have eternal life. I don't have to worry, and I don't have to be in fear. I have been around people, and this is just the role of a pastor, but I have been around people who have been... Um, been uh, on the edge of death, and I have been in, in the room with people who have actually died. I've been around some people who did not know the Lord at all. And when they were on their deathbed, and when they were actually passing from, from life to death physically, there was a fear. There was an uncertainty. There was no peace. There was no rest. There was concern. There was there was there was uh, in just intense fear. That was what I experienced and saw in people who had never accepted the Lord, who had never repented, who kept uh, God at arm's length, who really never wanted him in their lives. Then I've been around other people, believers in Jesus, who have been able to find the ability to rest in him, that knew that they were forgiven, that knew that they were accepted, that knew that they had eternal life with God, that they were looking forward to an eternity with him. And the peace that they had and the rest that they had and the joy even that they had was amazing. It was a night and day difference between a person without Christ and a person with Christ on their deathbed. You know who else it was uh, a, a big difference for? It was their family. The families of the ones who did not know the Lord, there was just uncertainty. There was fear. They did not know. The ones who knew the Lord and the families knew the Lord as well, they knew that they would be with each other again in a short amount of time, that they would spend eternity together. And even though it was sad and even though they were grieving, they had certainty that they were going to be together forever because they found rest. That's what Jesus offers. And so think of the two things that Jesus is contrasting here in these verses, a condemnation and an invitation. The condemnation is upon those who have rejected him, who won't repent, even though they have been given every opportunity, even though they have been given every freedom, they have, they have everything before them. They have still refused to receive Jesus. They have kept him at a distance. They have refused to let him in. They have been unrepentant. And Jesus says, woe to you. It's not going to be good. The judgment is going to come. Compare that to the ones who have received the invitation that Jesus has offered. Come unto me. Come to me, you who are worn out. Come to me, you who are tired. You who have big burdens that you've been carrying. You come to me, and I will forgive you 
and I will ease your burden, and I will lift it from you, and you just take my way of teaching, you take my plan of salvation upon yourself, and if you will do that, you will finally be able to rest. How great to be able to rest in Christ for the rest of life. It makes life pretty easy as you keep walking with him going forward. Well, join me back here tomorrow as we get into Matthew chapter 12 and start looking at more that Jesus was teaching. Uh, I hope that this was meaningful to you, and I hope that you got something out of today's message. Join me back here tomorrow, and we will get back into God's word.